Welcome to one more segment of Politics Done Right. I'm Egberto Willis, your host. We are here today with Ed Wynn. For more than three decades, H. Edward Wynn has helped governments and companies discover and implement solutions to complex, often divisive issues. He worked in all branches and levels of government and with both, uh, both with Republicans and Democrats. A Truman Presidential Scholar, Ed has a political science degree, summa cum laude, from the University of Illinois, and a law degree, magna cum laude, from Georgetown. Most importantly, Ed's not a political insider, and if you're a follower of politics done right, you know that is very important for us, and he's willing to call out any side on its BS, and that is in his bio. So, Ed, welcome to Politics Done Right. How are you doing today, my friend? I'm doing well. Thank you very much for having me on the podcast. Absolutely. First of all, let's before we get into talking about that excellent book that you wrote, I mean, I didn't get a chance to read it yet. I read the table of contents and I said, wow, I like this because, I mean, I just, I just completed my book on how to talk to people with a different philosophy. In my case, how to speak to people on the right. And I'm like, this may also become part of that series. So, Ed, tell me a little bit about yourself first. So, as you said in the brief bio that you provided, I've had experience both in government and in the private sector. And as part of that experience, I believe I have a way that we can work together to solve problems in a civil, productive way. And that's what the book is about. Now, it is interesting because you just released this book did you specifically time the book for releasing now or is just just coincidence that you've been thinking about this for some while because it it seems like you spent a lot of time on it i in scanning through the book um there's a whole lot of stuff that went into it yeah so the origin of the book is kind of interesting so uh when we were in the pr the same point in the process for the 2016 election i had the privilege of being able to cycle across the u.s from off the coast of Portland, Oregon to Portland, Maine. And as part of that, I was able to observe at the ground level, literally and figuratively, uh, how Americans were reacting to the various candidates in that election. And so that not only helped me predict the outcome of that election uh, to my fellow writers, but also enabled me to see what was really driving those uh, thoughts and feelings that led to those electoral decisions. Now, so, interesting. Go ahead. I'm sorry. And so I started writing the book. I retired uh, from my last position at the end of 2019 and started writing the book. And the timing actually just worked out very well. What was that last position? So in my last position, I was executive chairman of a telecommunications company here in Chicago. Okay. Interestingly, when you mentioned um, uh, you cycle across the country, that went dear to my heart. I've done 12 MS, 10 or 12 MS 150s where we've done, you know, 100 miles a day, that kind of, love that kind of a stuff. So we're on the same team, dear my friend. Now, interestingly, you went through a whole lot of different time zones, a lot of different types of cities, I imagine, when, when you went through there. So you actually got a chance to see on the ground level, the thinking of people, something that a lot of times the news media, because they're concentrated in cities and, 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 you know, more affluent areas, don't get to see. So tell me a little bit about what you saw on the ground. Yes, I think what I saw or what I did see, and again, we did go through cities, rural areas, uh, West Coast, mountain states, Midwest, obviously through a, a good slice of America. I did see that there were polar opposites. But I truly believe those make up, and the research supports it, maybe 10 to 15% on either end of that spectrum. The rest of us, and I'll include myself in there, we really were dissatisfied with certain things and satisfied with certain things. But we, there was a need for change. And I think, unfortunately, some of the rhetoric in the 2016 election caused a good majority, not maybe a majority, but a good number of people in that moderate group to reject one of the candidates, Hillary Clinton. And it was more about being against one candidate than being for another candidate. And so one of the things that I drew from this experience, not only predicting what the outcome would be, was also that rhetoric 
how rhetoric can be used to drive electoral results and that people were not well equipped to figure out what was truth from falsity and that was driven by the media. And so part of the book does discuss how we as citizens of the United States and as voters can get to that truth and make better electoral decisions and other decisions in our role as citizens. Uh, since you mentioned the book uh, right up front, let me go ahead and tell folks the name of the book is We the People Restoring Civility, Sanity, and Unifying Solutions to U.S. Politics. Yeah, uh, put it up. I'm going to have it in the screen as well, but put it up so people can see it. That is the book. And, and folks, uh, go out there. I think it, it launches tomorrow. Is that right? That is correct. It launches tomorrow. And that, that is August 4th that it's launching. If you're listening on podcasts tomorrow, that is when it's launching. Those of you that are listening today, you can always go into the blog post, click on it to go ahead and get that book. Anyway, Thank Ed, um, I, wanna, I wanna give some perspective here because uh, during the election, uh, and by the way, I am a Democrat. I'm not an independent like you are. I'm a Democrat. I, uh, actually, I'm a left-wing Democrat, but one that likes to engage all sides. I believe in communication. I also okay. believe that we all have to speak for the things that we want. Now, um, one of the things that, and I'd like to, before we get deep, too deep, deep into your book, I don't know how to resolve this. During the, the election, I did write an article stating that there's a good chance that Donald Trump was going to win. And at Daily Coast, which is a very progressive site, I got slaughtered for saying that because it was, their statement was, I'm not reading the polls. My statement was, I was in fact reading the polls. That said, I have a problem internally with us constantly giving the impression that Donald Trump won. Uh, uh, there, there, there's a certain democratic part of me. I'm from Central America, and I looked at America as a true democracy. And what 2000 and 2016 told me was, well, we really are not. Because in as much as we, we acknowledge that Donald Trump has won, the reality is more people did choose Hillary Clinton. How do we create this discussion about the, the sentiment of America when the sentiment of America did say that somebody else won? Yeah, I do discuss this in the book and it's the effect of the Electoral College. There are two effects that caused the result in 2016. And in fact, this is not the first time that the winner of the electoral vote did not also win the popular vote. But let me focus on what those two are. I think the one that everybody now realizes is that each state has a number of electoral votes and that that is weighted slightly in favor of smaller states because they get a minimum of three, the two for their senators, and then those smaller states just have one congressional representative. So they're slightly overweighted in the process. But that's not the main factor. The main factor, which applies to every state but to Maine and Nebraska, is that it's winner take all. Right. So that if you get 50% plus one vote in any state, you win all of those electoral votes. And that has a weighting effect that can, and I discuss this in the book as well, theoretically allow someone to be elected president even if they receive just 23% of the popular vote. And that's the issue. That's now, the issue. Um, you, you, you came up with a number that I hadn't seen before. You actually found a way that 20, by winning 23% of the popular vote, you could still win an election. That is correct. And it's wow. based on research from someone else. So I cite that in the book. But that is a reality. And I don't think that's widely known. And then the issue is, I think we focus too much on doing away with the Electoral College. Well, there are a lot of good constitutional reasons, perhaps, why we have that. But we don't need to take that significant of a step. The issue is really caused by the 50% plus one. And we have two states, Nebraska and Maine, that have modified that. States can do that on their own. And I think what we've seen is we need to have a discussion about revising the electoral process, not necessarily the college, to enable the popular vote to more correctly reflect the result. 
Now, that, I think this first part of your book, it's titled Understanding the U.S. Political Process, What You Need to Know That we, You Weren't Taught in Civics. So what do I need to know that I wasn't taught in physics? And I just want to you know that in as much as I'm a naturalized citizen, I did take American civics. <laughs> yeah, here's the basic problem. And I talk about this in the very beginning of the book. I think in American civics education, we focus too much on data and statistics. How many representatives are there? How many senators are there? How does a bill pass? Those things, quite frankly, aren't what we need to know. Any of us, particularly now in the information age, we can look that up in our smartphone in a fraction of a second. What we need to know is what is the significance of that? What I call the so what? So we have 100 senators. Why do we have that? What does it mean? How does it affect? And that directly ties to what I spoke about in terms of the weighting of the Electoral College. So I think there's been a tendency as well, you may ask, why don't we teach the so what in civics? I think people are afraid because if you get to the so what, you may trigger some of these positions that are opposing and they, people don't want to do that because they're concerned they'll get criticized for that. That's backwards. Hold on a second. I, I want you to expand on that, Ed. That is important, what you just said there. Expand on that. Yes. So here's, here's the, the issue. We don't teach one of the main things you need to know. One is substantively, what is the so what from all the data and statistics we need to know about our government? But secondly, and more importantly, is how do we have a civil discussion with various viewpoints around politics. And we don't really teach that in the majority of our schools. There's a fear that then you're going to be perceived as taking sides. You may be attacked by the extremes on either side. But what we really all need to know as citizens is how to have a civil, non-divisive discussion to get to real solutions. I love that. And let, let me tell you, and, and, and I, I can see that we there, there are certain issues that we are likely that likely we would not agree on. But the mere fact that you speak about that conversation, which is what I also believe strongly, and we always have to have the conversation to come somewhere to get, because you know what? There, there's a good chance that you're not going to change some of your beliefs. There's a good chance I won't change some of my beliefs. But guess what? We both have to coexist in the same country. So let's coexist in a manner that we can, right? Exactly. And I think that that's so important. And I use real examples in uh, the last part of the book to show how we can reframe our discourse in the, in the course of, some, <clears throat> excuse me, some very controversial issues. Um, abortion, gun rights, all of those things are very controversial. But when we start with our locked in positions and we're not going to budge, and we would just want to yell at each other and call them names, there's no way we can get to a reasonable solution to even begin to fix those issues. Now, I don't know if you covered this in your book. First of all, uh, l let me back up a bit. I like to ask people th that have insight like yours, if you've ever heard of the Powell Manifesto or the Powell Memo or any one of these particular documents. I have not. Okay. The reason I ask that is because this was a document put out by Lewis Powell. Um, he is going to, or he was appointed by Nixon. He's a Democrat that was appointed by Nixon to the Supreme Court. And he wrote a document stating that as we became a more progressive country, people would start asking too many questions of business. And he wrote a letter talking about having to infiltrate the schools, the churches, the media and everything, which I think was pretty successful. I think the letter was pretty successful. And we talk a whole lot about, um, about uh, um, this type of news, uh, fake news, et cetera, which you also mentioned. Uh, I don't know if you called it fake news in your book or not, but I do. did you, did you call it fake news in your book or? I do. I talk about the fake news issue, which is I don't find that label very appealing because mm -hmm. it's basically been used in the context of I don't like the news, therefore I'm going to label it as fake. Right. And what we really need to do is have a debate on the facts. And so if someone asserts a fact and you disagree with it, your response isn't to attack that person. It's not to call that information fake news. It's to come forward with your facts so that we can have a discussion. And that's not occurring today. And you know what? It's important because the reason I brought that, uh, the preamble of the Powell Manifesto up is for one specific issue. 
And I want to see how you would handle this based on what you've written. Um, let's, let's take a look at the, the Affordable Care Act. There's this thing called the mandate in the Affordable Care Act. And the, mandate, the purpose of the mandate to the Affordable Care Act was to institute responsibility. In other words, you are not going to not have insurance and when you get sick, because everybody has to be granted it if they request it, be able to buy it just at the time that you get sick to use it. So we had an individual mandate. There's an organization known as the Heritage Foundation, a think tank. That was yes. the brainchild of that organization. As soon as it became a part of the Affordable Care Act, suddenly there are the, the, the arguments that they released was in against the, the mandate. How do we handle when we talk about what is fake news or what is hypocritical news or whatever, how do we handle that in discussions when the discussions are taking place not for uh, reality, but for position? Absolutely. So let's talk about the Affordable Care Act. First of all, I will say I have read it every word. Mm -hmm. And I think that puts me in a very small minority of individuals yes, in this country, which is unfortunate because certainly every uh, congressional representative, senator who passed that bill or took a position yes or no on the bill, one would think we the people would expect that they would have read it. Yeah. Uh, and unfortunately, many of them admitted they hadn't even read it, which is unfortunate. So first you have to read it to see what is in there. But I, I want to commend you because it's unreadable. <laughs> it is very, it was very long and I read it uh, at the time it was passed, so it's been quite a while. But there are some things in there that are surprising to mo would be surprising to most Americans. And what I remember is a lot is uh, setting up a process to get information to do a value added tax. What the heck does that have to do with uh, affordable care? So there are some things in there that you just I think you need to know. And many times I think we've gotten surprised as Americans because of things that our representatives have passed that we say, where did that come from? It's just, so just thrown into the bill just thrown into the bill. I don't know the origins of it, but it's interesting. And if people don't read it, they won't uh, have that information. So the first thing is we have to get the facts. And with the, uh, affordable care, we need to get the facts in terms of what's in the bill, what are the proposals, what's the reason behind them. And we have to start with that. Specifically on the Affordable Care Act, I think the one thing that I would urge about that is let's start with what we think are common values. Let's not go to our positions yet. What are common values? And I think from that, there are probably some common positions that the vast majority of Americans would agree on, which is coverage for pre-existing conditions. So why do we keep going back to that? And why haven't we passed legislation at least that says, that can never be taken away. Disconnect that from, you know, how you get your health care, how it's provided. But what is troubling to me is our proposals that say repeal the Affordable Care Act, but there's nothing that says leave those protections that the vast majority, if not the overwhelming majority of Americans say they would expect and are consistent with our American values. Secondly, I think there are so many issues with healthcare that we really need to get those together and have a factual discussion and get that informed. When we passed the act, I'm not confident that we did that. Was the result perhaps the right result? Maybe. However, if you pass something and you haven't discussed what are we doing, why are we doing it? Do the facts support this? How is this going to play out practically? That's why we had all the litigation that happened after the act. Um, if I could take a second, Egberto, and talk about that in the discussions that are, I believe, are going on yet today in Washington, D.C. So the issue about the $600 bonus unemployment compensation. On the one hand, we hear uh, that we need to continue that. And that seems to be helping a vast majority of Americans. Then on the other side, we hear, well, that's paying them more, certain people more than they made when they were working, so we want 200 instead. Uh, there's a way to solve that, and I'm just shocked, just absolutely shocked that we haven't gotten to that. If the issue is, and I don't know if the facts are there or not, but I'll assume that they are, 
that some people are paid more with that supplement than they were with working. What's the one factual piece of information you have to provide if you apply for unemployment? Your tax, benefit? your taxes. <laughs> what were your wages yes. before you were unemployed? <laughs> so why don't we solve this really easily? So if anybody's listening that uh, has influence in this regard, this is really e easy to solve. We'll do $600 a week but no greater than your wages at the time you were unemployed. That's a program that each state could put in despite the, the challenges of their systems. Why can't we just agree to that? You know why we can't? I don't understand. We can't agree to that because it's not, look, you are rational. And you said your last, the, the reason I asked what your last job was, I thought your last job would have been something in, with a think tank that's trying to bring people together or something. You're an executive, okay? Uh, the, the, the issue, the issue um, Ed, is that there are many executives who understand that there is profit in chaos. And I think you as an executive know that as well. If there is chaos, you can, uh, there's a lot of finagling that can occur to maximize your profits. If there's order, your profit is probably pretty darn well known. You know, and I, I think that is one of the one, you know, one of the reasons I like a bifur bifurcated economy is that I want I want the laissez faire portion of the economy to be that portion of the economy that has a lesser impact on our well being, our health care, our you know, the things that really matter to us. And then the laissez faire part about cell phones and a coffee cup. I want you to go out there as an executive and do whatever kind of deals you can to sell how you want to do. But when it comes to basic health and when it comes to other, my God, we shouldn't have those kinds of things. And I think you, you, based on what you're saying, I think you would even agree with that. I think what I agree with Egberto specifically is this, that from the perspective of free enterprise and capitalism, most companies, in my experience, and I maybe have been lucky, most of the companies I work for, I think, did it right. And when I was in positions where we had to make public policy decisions, the companies allowed me to propose what was in the best interest of consumers, which I think you can't go wrong with that. Um, I think the problem is there are some companies, they're not even a majority, they're probably less than 20%, don't play by the rules and they are not held accountable for that. And I'm hopeful based on the congressional testimony that happened last week with regard to some of the technology companies that that information and those facts can come forward. Yes, everyone should be allowed to compete under a same common set of rules and principles. But when you start getting into things that violate antitrust law, and I'm an antitrust lawyer from prior background, when you do things where you're trying to eliminate competitors, not serve the consumer, that's where we have to draw the line and say the purpose of all of this is to make things better for all of us. And when we diverge from that and focus so much on putting profits in, and I would say profits that are so excessive, in the hands of top executives, not because they've come up with a better uh, product or service or because they've delivered it to consumers in a way that delivers a benefit, but because they've squashed the competition, done things to uh, prevent real competition, that's where we need to say no. And we need to be firm and strong about it. And I'm not sure we always have been in this country. That's one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you again is, you know, in, in reading the, the table of contents of your book and sort of that, uh, it, it was clear to me that, um, and bear, uh, bear with how I'm going to say this. I mean no offense, but uh, you are one of the good capitalists, okay? No offense intended in that statement. But what I mean by that is uh, that, uh, that modal gives you the opportunity of being good or not. You have that choice. Uh, and, and the thing about it is those who make that choice do well. I have a whole list of these companies that I, that, I, that I always say, these are good companies that are doing their job, but there are so many out there. Uh, and you know, when you have a country 
where most people are in dire straits. And again, I live in, I, I live in a, a fairly nice neighborhood. I don't see a whole lot of the, these things. And what concerns me the most is how blind we are to much of the pain that is going through America right now. If you look at the 40 million people that, that are laid off right now and the pain that they're gonna have to go through over the next few weeks, you don't even see it on TV, Ed. No, and it is so frustrating. I mean, there are examples that I've seen by some news organizations that cover this. Um, and if I can say names, ProPublica, NPR, I think yes. they do a very good job. And it's really unfortunate. And what's most unfortunate is that our elected officials seem to ignore that suffering of the people that they represent. I mean, we have that suffering in this country in spades right now. It's so unfortunate and unnecessary. Right. So we have the effects of the coronavirus and we basically make statements like, oh, we only have cases because we test. That's absolutely false. So if I could spend a second on that, the number of tests and the number of cases are largely irrelevant. The number that we should all be looking at is the positivity rate. Our scientists have told us that if the positivity rate, that is those that test positive, uh, that percentage of the number of people tested is above 5%, we have a problem. Yes. It's not who is doing the most tests. That's maybe you, you need to do that, the higher positivity rate is. But the thing you should focus on is that positivity rate. And if it's above 5%, if it's above 10%, or above 20%, as it has been in some states in Texas, here, yes. that says one thing. We may not like what it says, but the data doesn't lie. It says the coronavirus is spreading. And if it is spreading, we must take certain measures to protect people from the spread. But we focused on this false thing about the numbers. And I wish the media as well would focus on that positivity rate. When you do those comparisons and you look at it to other countries in across the globe, you can see, yes, we have a problem and it's spreading. And by the way, it's not a competition to see who can do the most tests or any of that. The, the enemy isn't each other. The enemy isn't other countries. The enemy is the virus. So what do we need to do to stop this virus? And the only way you can do that is get the facts and make sure they're relevant and act on those facts. And that's where we're just missing it. Ed, when I could speak to you for a whole hour or two, but we only have a segment. So uh, what did would you have liked me to ask you that I didn't ask you and rest assured that all the information about your book and so forth will be in a blog with this segment isolated from the whole show as well. So I'll let you have that. Egberto, I think we had a very good discussion. Um, the only thing that I would wanted you to ask me about, and I know you've discussed it on other podcasts, is about voting. And that is so important that we have that voting. And if I could spend just a second uh, on that. You know, we've got this debate right now about in-person voting and mail-in voting. And I'd like to make three points about that if I could. First, absentee voting is mail-in voting. How do you think it gets to the polling place? Is there a Brinks truck that arrives at your door and delivers it personally? No, it goes through the mail. So we just need to say that's mail-in voting. The second point is that we have done mail-in voting in a number of states, and there are no issues with that in terms of significantly increasing fraud. We've done it, and we've done it successfully. The third point is, I think we can solve this issue. So if I look at the Wisconsin primary uh, that occurred earlier this year, mm -hmm. Milwaukee typically has or has 180 polling places. Do you know how many they had open for that primary? I think- Five. Yes, yes, ridiculous. Five. So when you're having a pandemic and you want to reduce exposure, would you have fewer polling places or more? More, so you have my spread it out, yeah. Here's my proposal. I think it's too late to maybe get the rest of the states to have uh, proper mail-in voting. Uh, Should have worried about that back when we knew there was Russian, Russian interference in the election, but we didn't. But here's the proposal. Why don't we have 
in-person voting requ required for everyone unless you know the medical reasons or some reason why you can't get to the polls not absentee voting you need to get to your poll but rather than to make sure it's safe for everyone let's expand the number of polling places in Milwaukee, let's go from 180 to 360 so people can safely vote. Let's do early voting. If you believe in the integrity, that the only way we can ensure the integrity of the election is in-person voting, and I'm not a believer in that, but let's say that's the case. Let's have more polling places so people can do it safely and we can get valid election results. And that way people can feel safe when they go to the polls. So that's the one question. Uh, you, I was uh, thinking you might ask, and that's my response to it. Interestingly, I think you turned it into three questions, Ed. <laughs> Ed, Ed Wynn, author of We the People, Restoring Civility, Sanity, and Unifying Solutions to U.S. Politics. Ed, I really enjoyed having you on Politics Done Right. I really enjoy your insight. You are a communicator, and I'll, I hope to have you on again sometime. Great. Thank you very much, Egberto, and I very much enjoyed our discussion uh, today. Thank you. I'm Egberto Woolies, host of Politics Done Right, an independent news program. I post several news videos of interest every day. I ask you so kindly to subscribe to my channel, and please leave me some comments. Thank you very much.